One, two. Is this on? Alex, the mic isn't working. Testing one, two, no? Testing one, two, three, can you hear me? All right, Alex, maybe you can make this a little bit louder. So I wanted to take the opportunity and thank everyone for coming, particularly Soroka Hospital. I think we're in for a really exciting evening uh, this evening, and we couldn't be prouder to have you here. I know earlier I had the opportunity to give everyone a tour, so rather than go into the specifics of the club, other to, other, uh, to say that the Explorers Club is a non-for-profit. We are the second oldest member of the United Nations, the second oldest NGO, and we give approximately a million and a half dollars per year in student grants that fosters uh, field science and exploration, which couldn't be more apropos to the work and the efforts that, we're, that we'll hear more about this evening with Soroka. So at this point, I'm going to ask Rachel to, to step forward and do the introduction, and I just wanted to thank everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Will. Can everyone hear me? Okay, good. 
We're honored to be here at the Explorers Club. My name is Rachel Heisler Scheinfeld. I am the executive director of American Friends of Soroka. We're a community of philanthropists and friends and supporters of a beautiful hospital in Israel that takes care of 1.2 million people. So it's a huge responsibility and thank <laughs> and a holy mission for us. So, Will Brosman, I wanna thank you so much for um, inviting us and for hosting us. And it touched our heart in such a deep way when the Explorers Club said to us, the Soroka team, yes, you are explorers of exactly the same ilk as we are, except your exploration is scientific. And, and we're just honored to be amongst the people who have walked through this hall and all the members. So thank you so much. I also want to thank Felix and Janet and Kevin and the whole um, Explorers Club team who made this so easy and pleasant to put together the evening. I want to thank a special friend here, Judith Hernstadt, who connected the dots and introduced us to Will. And she is a dear friend of Eliza de Sola Mendez, who is one of our um, Soroka team members. I want to welcome some of the board members of Soroka Friends who are here with us tonight. Henry Bull, Devora Fields, and Jay Selman, and you'll hear from Jay at the end of the program. He is also a, um, a neurologist, and he is the um, person who will be moderating the Q&A after. So also want to say hello, yes, to our team members, Valerie and Rahel, who are here. And they work with Soroka Friends every day, helping us produce events like this, where we live to tell the story about Soroka and spread awareness about what we do. So very little bit of information for you before we get started. There's a map of Israel. And Israel is known, um, and people who might not have been there will know that there are two cities there that they could say right off the bat. There's Tel Aviv and there's Jerusalem. Many people might not have known or been to Be'er Sheva. Our hospital is in Be'er Sheva. It's considered the south of Israel. It's in the desert. So it's actually in the desert called the Negev Desert. And, but if you look at the map, it's tr truly in the heart of the country. So we, it just underscores how strategic our hospital is for the land of Israel. And we are in probably the most diverse area of the country, and it's a very diverse country to begin with. 60% of the residents of the area where we are are Bedouin. Or, so when you learn and hear and read in the newspapers about Israel, it's very important to recognize that every day there is truly coexistence and most of it is you know, peaceful and working towards a just society that will um, provide a beautiful lifestyle and living environment for the children of the country. So here at Soroka, we just day in and day out take care of our patients without any regard for what their national origin is and so forth. And we happen to, by the way, as with, along with all that sensitivity and special TLC for our diverse and sometimes underserved and sometimes more needy and less educated population, we also have many world-class centers of medical excellence. In recent years, we opened a new comprehensive cancer center. We have one of the largest, actually the largest and the busiest emergency room in all of Israel. And we have an amazing clinical research department. And truly, one of the jewels of the crown is our genetics program. We are so proud of Dr. Ohad Burke and the work that he's done in genetics. And that's why we are so thrilled to be able to introduce him to you tonight. So before I introduce him, I want to invite you to upcoming events. So uh, there are, um, like now that you're here, we hope that you'll learn more about Soroka and maybe avail yourself some of the programs that we have. And we have a program coming up in New York City in two weeks that is on, um, it's on life sciences. It's life science, it's meant for people who are in the life sciences or wanna learn how to transfer your life sciences expertise into a, um, into the real world, and um, 
for commercialization. And there happens to be someone in the audience who I know is from Ben Gurion University, and that um, the speaker at that event will be the former CEO of Ben Gurion University, Dr. Rivka Karmi, who also happens to be a geneticist. Um, so, and was a genesis at Siroka before Ohad Berg. So there's a lot of connectivity there. On November 1st, we're having our gala in New York City at the Pierre Hotel, and it's a really high impact evening, and we'd love to share invitation with you. And for all those explorers who haven't been to Israel yet and want to find a way to go to Israel with a really fun group, we're having a mission to Israel in May. So you can definitely um, connect with us and ask for information and we'll send you invitations to all that. And we also have chapters for, of Soroka Friends in very active um, chapter in Miami and a somewhat active chapter in Los Angeles. So we hope to um, see you in those places. So another word or two about Soroka and about why we're here today. So have you heard the term Israel 21C? Yeah, so it's a term that's used to like represent the essence of why Israel is known for so much um, scientific and medical innovation. And it's a special DNA that we um, believe comes from elements of um, army service, of pioneering spirit, and so forth. And our hospital is located in, like I had mentioned to you, we're in Be'er Sheva. There is a major university right across the street from where they are. There are two major medical schools for which we are the teaching hospital of that medical school. There's a high-tech park that is the cybersecurity hub of Israel. There's a lot of stuff happening. And then on top of all that, there's also the Israeli intelligence operation, which is based in the South. So a lot of like the most brilliant minds are focused right where we are. And we, um, we consider Dr. Ohad Burke to be one of the absolute most brilliant of all of those. So it's my great honor to be able to present him here tonight. Well, one other thing I wanted to tell you about Soroka and why, um, what, what I love the most about it and what I love saying the most about it is our pioneer, when I mentioned the pioneering spirit, our founding father of Soroka was the first prime minister of Israel, um, David Ben-Gurion, and he had many catchphrases that he would use to discuss, um, to speak about the Negev. He loved the Negev. And he said the future of Israel would be born in the Negev and that humanity would be tested in the Negev. And truly, that's our journey. We consider ourselves modern day pioneers because we still have all those tests and trials and tribulations, but nevertheless, we persevere and come out with great research, which Dr. Burke will tell us about. So. His um, CV is so amazing. You can just see the headlines there. But what I want to say about him is not only is he perhaps one of the premier geneticists working in the field today, globally, but he is a huge humanitarian who lives and breathes and devoted his entire career to wanting to help others. And he picked Soroka. We were so fortunate that he picked Soroka as the place in the world where his, the combination of his medical and um, technical prowess would improve the lives of the most people. And what we're learning now in the world is we have all this great clinical research, great genetic discoveries at Soroka. We're definitely improving lives in the Negev in Israel, but we're also saving lives around the world. And so we are very proud of what we do and we'd love to um, continue to share information with you so you can feel free to approach me after and you know give us your contact info and we'd be happy to share things so with that said i call ohad burke to um join us and at the end of his talk you can ask some questions and or you can give us some written questions if you want. Um, and Dr. Jay Selman, who is also the head of the Medical and Scientific Advisory Council of Soroka Friends, will be moderating the Q&A. So enjoy. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. Good evening. So uh, I'm, I'm a physician in training. I did pediatrics, and then a PhD, 
at the Weizmann Institute, and then a postdoc at the NIH, and then a fellowship in, in clinical genetics. Can you hear me? No. no. OK. Is this better? Yes. First time in my life that I'm moving a microphone high, higher up. <laughs> uh, OK. Anyway, so uh, what I'll tell you in the coming 45 minutes or so is, is my journey over the past 22 years, which is really a, a, a dream for a clinical, cl clinical researcher, OK, an MD, PhD. And you see that it really combines both. So I get up every day at 3 a.m. and I drop dead at 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. and you'll see what's done in the middle. So things are never done alone and there's my team at Soroka Medical Center. Remember that we give service for more than a million people in southern Israel. And then across the street, wonderful teams throughout the years of uh, graduate students, very brilliant top minds, many of them are MD-PhDs that are growing up. And then there is the third team, which is in the field, which are nurses going out to villages and doing the testing. And it's uh, very rarely that one gets to do both the research and the medicine. I see patients every day, five days a week, and, uh, and also the prevention and sitting in my office and a couple comes in and they're both carriers of a disease and they opt for chorionic villi sampling to test this pregnancy. And I don't even tell them that that routine test that they did was actually a PhD in my lab five years ago or seven years ago or maybe a year ago. Uh, we'll talk a lot about the Bedouins, but for the Jewish community, you, you know that Ashkenazi Jews have many known genetic diseases, but Sephardi Jews, non-Ashkenazi Jews, which are at least half of world Jews, have also their diseases. And the most common diseases in Sephardi Jews that are being tested for have also been discovered in my lab. OK. Um, so the Bedouins in southern Israel, about 300,000. But they emerged actually from less than 20,000 in 1948. And they are in tribes, about 24, 25 tribes. And they marry within tribes. And every tribe will not marry another tribe. So for various reasons, we can discuss that later. Some will marry another specific tribe, but that's it. And that's been going on for many years. On top of that, they marry their first cousins most of the time. It used to be until several years ago, 60% of the marriages. Now it's about 40%. But when the patient comes in, the couple comes in, you ask, are, are you related? And of course, their fathers are brothers, or their mothers are sisters, or both. Many are double first cousins. Sometimes you look at the people and at the couple, and they actually resemble each other. Um, so that's a routine. By the way, it's a routine throughout the Arab world. In the Arab world, it's throughout the Arab world around 25%, but here it's about 60%. But it's not just the first cousins, it's also within the tribe for three or 400 years. So, so the genes of the husband and the wife are very similar. Just about genetic diseases that we deal with, which are what we call recessive diseases. So of every gene, we get two copies, one from the father and one from our mother. There are two, about more than 20,000 genes. If I am a carrier of several mutations, and usually I would be, any, anyone is, my wife is likely to be a carrier of mutations in other five or two or four genes of the 20,000. But if we share the same grandfather and he had a mutation, then of course the chances that we're both carriers of the same mutation is much higher, okay? Tremendously higher. So we have actually families with two or three or four diseases in the same family that both parents are carriers of. Um, hundreds of diseases. Some of them are known but the local mutations were not known, and many are new mutations that were in genes that were not yet associated with human diseases. So when I came in 
some 20 years ago, uh, Rivka Karmi, before me, already set up the Genetics Institute, characterized clinically some of the diseases, and actually the very first diseases were already sorted out through collaborations, mostly with the US. And when I came in, I, I said, okay, I'm running the place, but from this point on, we do everything in-house. Just, I, I'll run through, I just want you to get an idea, sorry for the pictures, but just to make sure you understand that these are serious diseases. So, patients come in, they get, go through the routine testing, they don't have a known disease, and then it moves across the street to my team in the research lab, and then a year or two or three later, it comes back to the clinical institute, and then goes to the team in the community. In the team in the community, we have also a lot of education, so I, I have genetic counselors in Arabic going from high schools to colleges nearly every week, giving uh, tutorials about genetic diseases, about prevention, about testing. We work very closely with the Muslim leaders, and in fact, we have their okay. And in fact, when we go to colleges, usually uh, uh, a religious leader will come with us. So not only we have their okay, but we have their support. And then there are the nurses going out throughout the villages, doing the testing, so people don't need to come to us most of the time. And if two members, the, the spouse, uh, the husband and wife are found to be carriers, they're sent back to the clinical institute for genetic counseling and testing in for the embryo. And in the Israeli system, both chorionic villi sampling or amniocentesis during pregnancy or even IVF with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which is a costly procedure to check the embryos when they're still microscopic and put in an embryo that is fine, all that is covered by the public health system, which seems very costly, but when you consider the costs of uh, keeping uh, patients' lifetime, of course, that's a very good investment of the health system, but it's also, of course, tremendously important for the families. So just We'll run through this, it's a busy slide, but don't worry. I, I, uh, in terms of research, so when we are looking at a new disease, we're looking usually at a change of one letter out of the three billion, 3,000 million letters in the genome, okay? And you need to find the one letter that causes this disease that has not been sorted out before. For that, you need computer, uh, sciences, okay, so there are a lot of software that's available, but we generate quite a lot on our own. Then you need to be convinced, you know, when pharma companies try to replicate scientific work, they regretfully manage to replicate about 50 or more percent, but not, not, not a lot, okay? In the 20 years I've been in this business, I didn't need to retract any single sentence, okay? The, what we do must be totally reliable because it moves tomorrow morning for really live human testing. So we do animal experiments in fruit flies, in zebrafish, in mice, all done in-house. So it's not actually a genetics lab, it's far beyond that. We do in-house everything from the clinical phenotyping and description of the disease to the computational work to the genetics, to the biochemistry, to the models of all sorts. Okay, and then, again, I'm very active also in the educational part and in the testing in the community. This is a partial list of the diseases discovered in our lab. I'm talking about totally new diseases. Some of them, are local diseases in a certain tribe, but also these are not so rare because once we publish a new disease, it turns out there are several hundreds at least of patients in the world that email us later and, oh, we were tested and actually now we know what we have because it was found that we have another mutation in the same gene. So rare diseases, actually 5% of human population have a rare disease of some sort. And 
we actually supply a lot of the information that enables uh, diagnosis of ferret diseases throughout the world. Other diseases are actually uh, common in the Arab world, so the Bedouins that are in the Negev in southern Israel migrated anywhere between 100 to 400 years ago, depending on the tribe, from Saudi Arabia, from Egypt, from the entire region. And some of the diseases we discovered are actually turned out to be founder mutations throughout the Arab world. So as a start, we mapped the population, what tribes are related to what tribes, both by their history and by their genetics, so that if I see a patient with a muscular dystrophy in one tribe and in another tribe, I know whether it's likely to be the same gene or oh, wait a minute, the, this tribe ca came from Egypt, this one is from Saudi Arabia, unlikely. It's probably two different diseases. Then we, I won't go into that, but we designed a lot of software that is unique to us and is very effective in our hands. And I'll just run, I'm sorry about some of the pictures, but that's life, okay? So we, that's what we explore in the Explorers Club. Uh, some of, some of the, I'll give you just some of the diseases, okay? A, a few. Uh, th this was a horrible disease. Uh, I went to several of the families. They, they are born with severe mental retardation. They're very spastic. They can't hardly move anything. And they are, they live forever, like 10, 20, 30 years. So you have uh, a, a father of 11 or 12 having four kids that he moves around, they're 20 or 15 years old in diapers and they're moved around the, the house. And a few were born every year, okay? And when we, once we discovered this disease and started immediately screening for that, this disease is disappearing. No more cases are born with this horrible disease. Uh, Again, sorry about that, but that's in eight different tribes and they survive anywhere from hours to several months. We thought because it's in eight different tribes that that would be an ancient Arab mutation, but no, it turned out that it was three different mutations and three different genes, three different diseases actually that look very much the same, okay? And Look at the family tree, okay? Uh, the circles are females, the, the, the squares are males. You can see how many kids uh, uh, a family has um, and the intermarriages with, between the families. From the genetics, we go back to biochemistry and actually we discover new biochemistry, so it didn't make sense for some of the mutations causing the same disease, how, how come the, uh, that happens? And, and what we showed is that one gene is actually essential for the activity of another gene. So, so we start with genetics and actually discover also new biochemistry. This is a horrible disease. Kids are born totally fine, so it's, it's very, uh, Horrible also for the mothers because by the age of one year, they're totally fine. They actually start standing up, they say mom, dad, and then they start deteriorating and within the second year of life, they become totally disconnected. And, uh, and the problem is that the mother knows that the next pre pregnancy, she has a 25% chance of having a kid with the same disease, but, but she has no way of knowing. And not only at birth, but even at birth she does know, okay? So it's, it's, she has this horrible first year of, of waiting to see what's going to happen. And what we showed is that the problem here is with an enzyme in the brain that is in charge of taking apart lipids in the brain cells, okay? So these lipids, these phospholipids form and are taken apart, form and are taken apart. But if the enzyme that takes them apart, doesn't work, so they form and form and form and they accumulate until the brain cells are full of this fat and they stop working. Okay, so um, this is an interesting disease for us because it turns out that after we discovered it, that actually this mutation is common throughout the Arab world. It was discovered in parallel also in Saudi Arabia. 
And another thing is that iron accumulates in the brain cells of these patients, and why does a problem in fat accumulation cause iron to accumulate is still a wonder. And iron accumulation is part of the process in Alzheimer and Parkinson, and actually people have been since looking at this enzyme in these common diseases, and it turns out that it does play a role there. So, so you start with a rare disease, find a mechanism, and from that you branch out. This is another disease of a very unique heredity. I won't go into it. I just will show you that to prove that the mutation causes this potassium channel ion to, to work wrong, we used all sites of frogs, okay, and in a, a cell, a tiny oocyte microscopic of a frog, you can actually put in an electrode and measure, measure a currents, and that was done by the graduate student in the lab, and, the, and you see that the normal current is there and with the mutation doesn't work. Small head with severe mental retardation and small brain, okay, microcephaly. In one tribe, it's one gene with one, with one uh, pathway. In another tribe, it's a totally different gene, another molecular pathway. Each slide is, of course, two or three wor years of work with uh, tons of biochemistry to, put, to prove everything. And in the third tribe, this was actually a gene that nothing was known about, and we started from zero, and we actually built up all the biochemistry, all, all the function of this gene. Uh, no eyeballs, okay? Three different genes in three different tribes. Osteogenesis imperfecta, fragile bone syndrome. This is found throughout the world, but throughout the world it's because of mutations in collagen. And it's a dominantly inherit, inheritable uh, disease. So if you have one good copy and one bad copy, you're already sick, and there's a 50% chance that you give it for the next generation. In our Bedouins, it's a, we discovered it's a totally different gene, totally different heredity, totally different mechanism. And in fact, the mutation we found was later found to be the common mutation in the Arab world for osteogenesis imperfecta. So in the Arab world, anywhere in the Arab world, or at least Saudi Arabia and that part of the Gulf states, uh, when you look at the why now, you know it's this story and not the one in the textbook. Sometimes you learn about history and you run into somewhat crazy things. So, so a tribe uh, came in with a muscular disease and one of my graduate students was working on that and at the same time, a Jewish Ethiopian family came with a muscle disease. And this crazy student of mine said that it might be the same disease and I told him, no way. And he found a region in the genome where there must be the mutation for the Bedouin disease, and he found a region in the genome where it's very likely that the mutation the Jewish Ethiopian disease. And oops, of the 3 billion, 300,000 letters in the genome, half a million overlapped. So looking back, including the mutation that he later showed to cause the disease. So these two families, a Bedouin family that originates from Egypt and a Jewish Ethiopian family, seven or 800 years ago, actually when you read the history books of that region, there was commerce between Ethiopia and that part of Egypt, and they are related. Uh, this is also a story which is a story which is interesting scientifically because the gene that he found had no known function and he had no way of proving that he was right. And what he ended up doing is generating frogs without the frog gene. And he showed that the defect in the frog could be corrected by inserting the human normal gene, but not by the human mutant gene. So you know, we, we always go to a different model per every uh, experiment, and, uh, and that ended up this story. The two families opted, I offered them to meet each other, and they did, the, these very distant relatives, and since then the 
Jewish family had a, a healthy child through uh, PGD, through IVF, and the Bedouin had the normal pregnancy with chorionic relay sampling, testing, and, and they also have a healthy child. Mind you, these families don't dare usually have any kids. I mean, uh, the, the both families in this case had only two children. In both cases, both children died of the disease, and they were, uh, the, the, in fact, the Jewish Ethiopian family was at the age of 40 and last minute managed to uh, just, I mentioned, I'll mention a few words, just Jewish diseases. So this, these are the two most common diseases in Sephardi Jews that are being tested for now routinely in Israel. Uh, they look the same. Kids are born fine, and by two years of age, you see the, this, uh, wait, where's my mouse? Anyway, the, this area. The black spaces, the black spaces should not be there. It should be brain tissue, okay? So, so the brain sort of shrinks within the, the first uh, two years. They're born fine, and, and by two years, they have severe epilepsy. They're very spastic, and they're practically disconnected. And uh, actually, I have the memory of the first family I visited at home, and they, they had only two kids. The two kids were in the living room on two huge hospital beds watching TV, which they couldn't really see. I mean, they, they, uh, fed through a gastric tube. One was already 16, the other one was 13. And the parents said that since the day the first one was born, 24 hours a day, one of them was at home. You know, it's, it's like an intensive care. Uh, and, and this family, they, they decide not to give birth anymore. Um, what we discovered are two different diseases. One is, you know, there's selenium in your vitamins, right? So selenium goes into a specific amino acid, the building block of proteins. 25 proteins in the brain depend on that. And this enzyme, this gene encodes for an enzyme that imports the selenium into this protein. So, so without that, you can take as much selenium as you want. It doesn't work, okay? And what happens is this horrible disease. And it turned out that Moroccan Jews have a mutation in this gene. And by chance, Iraqi Jews have another mutation in the same gene. So if a Moroccan Jew marries a Moroccan Jew, it's, they're at risk, and Iraqi, Iraqi, or a mix. The second disease, which looks clinically exactly the same, is in a totally different pathway, totally different gene, only in Moroccan Jews, two different mutations. One is an ancient Moroccan, mutation, the other one is from the Spanish expulsion uh, of uh, the 1400s. Um, model systems, so we use various ways. The, this is the eye of a fruit fly, of a fly, and here you can see the normal eye uh, below the left panels and the right panel, you see it's totally, look, the right lower panel is totally disorganized with the mutation, the human mutation. This is microcephaly, a small head. We in introduced the human mutation to, fly to flies and they had smaller heads. Here we, in this case of a microcephaly of a small head disease, another gene, we use zebrafish and the zebrafish with a mutation, the human mutation introduced into the zebrafish gene equivalent of the human gene. And you, you get smaller heads. And ophthalmia, remember the kids with no eyeballs? Okay, if you, we inserted this the, to prove that, because again, we need to prove and make sure we're right, okay? We generated mice with exactly the same mutation in the mouse gene, and the right eye, as you see, is not there. This is uh, hyperflexibility syndrome with excessive bleeding, and we generated mice, again, with the human mutation in the mouse gene, and look at the tail of the mouse. You can actually make a knot. It's, it's flexible, 
okay? And bleeding, look at the left panel, if you just cut a small cut in the tail of uh, a mutant mouse, it bleeds long, much longer than the normal mouse. So, uh, as I'll show you later on, we don't do it for fun. We can actually, through the mice and the zebrafish and the fruit flies, uh, discover the mechanism deep in, okay? We do a lot of RNA sequencing, a lot of, uh, never mind, a lot of work that uh, uh, electrophysiology of neurons, various things. Another twist is common diseases, okay? So when you look at a common disease, in the general population, it's made up of various genes, but in, in uh, such an inbred community, usually a disease will be because of a single gene that went wrong, okay? And this is, I'll go now quicker. So atrial fibrillation, the most common uh, cause of uh, arrhythmia, cardiac arrhythmia in humans. We found a new gene for that with a new mechanism and actually we showed that this thing works too much. So actually it's a new target for drugs to treat uh, art atrial fibrillation. Uh, gout, a 2,000 year old disease, we found a new mechanism for that. It's nice to discover new things about a very ancient <coughs> disease. Psoriasis, seborrheic dermatitis, we found a crucial gene in these two diseases. I'm rushing through it, but each study has very detailed downstream pathway uh, uh, studies done. The first gene for nearsightedness, we show that a gene that affects collagen in the eye causes that so that the eyeball becomes longer. So although the lens is fine, the rays don't end up in the right place because the eyeball is longer and now it, 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 it reaches the wrong place the, uh, in the eye. The, uh. Why do some people have constipation while others have a tendency for diarrhea, okay? So through uh, studies of a family with very severe constipation in the newborn, we discovered a gene that does that. And in fact, we showed that the mutation we found stops the activity of this gene. And parallel to us, another group in the world found a mutation that activates this gene. And actually, these kids were born with congenital diarrhea. So uh, 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 you rarely have in biology such clear stories. Uh, another twist in this story is that actually this enzyme uh, is turned on by the cholera toxin. So if th you think that if you're in the desert and there was a cholera uh, disaster and everyone had diarrhea and died, those that had a mutation with a tendency for constipation did not have severe diarrhea and survived. And that is maybe why this mutation had a positive selection and, and these people survived more. ADHD, ADHD is common, right? We know it's, there are familial tendencies to that, but there are very rare cases. In fact, this is perhaps almost the only case that you have a single mutation uh, that causes ADHD. So it started with a Bedouin family, three kids, all three extremely hyperactive uh, and but otherwise they're fine. We found the mutation that causes this in that family. And then we generated mice with exactly the same mutation in the mouse gene. And with the mice, we could take out brain cells, brain neurons, study the electrophysiology, study the molecular pathways. And actually now I think this is probably the best or one of the very best models for human ADHD to test further drugs. Just so you are convinced that I'm not cheating, uh, these are two siblings, two mice, one with a mutation, one without, okay? They're actually twins, but not identical. One with a mutation, one with, without, and look at that. Okay. So you're convinced that we've done some research and we discovered some new diseases. And then come, I'll talk shortly about prevention. So first, you, you can't just come to people and say, get tested, here is 
you'll give us blood, okay? So we have, for the past decade or more, nearly every week, genetic counselors or nurses trained for that, going to, uh, to high schools, giving talks about genetic diseases, about cousin marriages, about doing genetic screenings, okay? And then we meet at least once a year, usually twice a, a year, with the re religious leaders of the region. And then we went to the colleges, and every, nearly every education student, the future teacher, undergoes our course, which is a, a half-day course, with include, which includes one hour by a religious leader that says that it's right to do that and they should do that, okay? And it's done in Arabic. And then, of course, there are the politics and, and the... Uh, okay, so, so this is really a lot of groundwork done for more than a decade. Uh, and then there's the testing, okay? So there are a team of nurses, more than 10 nurses, Arab speaking, going through the villaging, do, villages, doing the testing, and they're in close contact with us all the time. So, so this is our, my third branch. Thousands of tests a year, a tailored uh, panel of 100 diseases, and actually it's the right panel because 30% of the women are found to be carriers, and 10% of their spouses are found to be carriers, which means, wait a minute, these couples are at a 25% risk of a disease every pregnancy, okay? And couples at risk are referred back to the genetic uh, center and are offered either free either IVF with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or testing through pregnancy. And of course, we're set with the religious leaders that the Muslim law allows abortions until 120 days, so which, by which time we can reach uh, diagnosis. Again, the, you know, like any religion, there are different views of what is the right timing, what is the wrong timing, and our close relations with the religious leaders enabled that. Many diseases are elim eliminated, okay? Well, I meet uh, gynecologists and pediatrists people and they say, wait, well, oh, wait a minute, this disease, I, I used to see several cases a year and I don't see them anymore. Oh, right. Okay, and, and it actually works. And the main thing, infant mortality rate is how many kids die by the age of one year. 15 years ago in this community, it was 17 out of a thousand. In the rest of Israel, it's three or four out of a thousand, okay? and we drove it down to 10 out of 1,000. Nearly all of it is because of genetic diseases. So, so yes, it's very effective, this thing. So for a, a medical person who does also research to see in your own lifetime uh, things happening and, and such an effect, and the nice thing is that it will go forever. You know, Tezax was discovered in Ashkenazi Jews, but it's being tested every generation from now on. So you, you, you see your impact on the families you study, then on the entire community, and then maybe on the entire Arab world or the entire Sephardi Jewish community. And then you know that it's also for future generations, not only for this. So, and, and you actually don't die before seeing that, which, you know, and the patients come to you as a routine. And, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great joy. Uh, worldwide, that was 2012, Israel had no relations whatsoever with Qatar, and I was invited to Qatar for the BBC World with uh, Tim Sebastian, the Doha debates on, on cousin marriages, and they decided I was the person in the world for, for this thing. And the, the Israeli government, of course, said that, oh, great, but you know, it's up to you, <laughs> you know, if something happens. And anyway, uh, and, and then came Al Jazeera later on and, and various things. So, so yes, the impact is throughout the Arab world. And interestingly enough, when you sit in such uh, places with Muslims throughout the Arab world, the, the, the questions are the same, you know? If I don't marry my first cousin, who will marry me? And the, the girl asking that is a gorgeous, bright, wonderful girl, and, and, and she, she is worried, okay? 
Uh, and, and actually, I don't tell them to marry completely out of the family because there is tradition and you go, don't go against traditions. But if you marry your fourth cousin, then actually the risk of a specific mutation for that family is very small, okay? And, and usually it means that our screening will find it if, if, if you share a mutation. So, so you have ways of, of keeping traditions and and we'll end with this. Treatments, we've plunged into that too. And I'll finish with this story. A muscle disease in a Bedouin tribe. They are healthy by the age of 30, then 30 years. Deteriorate by 50, they can't breathe. They can't move their arms or legs at all. You it drops. And they die around 52, 53, 54. They can't breathe, okay? The, the muscles of breathing don't work. And uh, we found the enzyme, the mutation was in a gene that encodes something called HMG-CoA reductase, okay? Now this enzyme actually manufactures in the body something called mevalonolactone. So I said, well, why don't we give the patients this thing? There's a problem though that it was never given to humans before. There's no such medication. So we home cooked it. And we purified it and we gave it to mice to see that it doesn't kill them. And then we went to the Helsinki uh, for approval and no one would give us approval to give it to anyone. But by that time, one patient was going to die. So we got an approval for compassionate use. Uh, and she's been taking it now for a year and a half. After four months, she started moving her hands and feet. She can actually uh, I breathe for many hours with perfect oxygen saturation. Since the COVID, we all know about oxygen saturation. And, uh, and there comes a twist to that. Okay, that's, sorry, that's, that's the patient. Oh, anyway, she can lift her hand, hand. Now this is what we went on to do. So, so the nice thing is that HMG-CoA reductase is actually the target of statins. Statins is what 200 million people take for to lower cholesterol, okay? Now, in 20% of them, uh, in 20% of them, they have muscle problems. And in fact, a few thousand people a year have severe muscle problems that don't stop once they stop their statins, okay? So what we did is we gave my tons of statins, the one on the left, and he falls off, he can't hold on. The one on the right gets the same amount of high dose of statins, but gets also our medication in his drinking water, and he doesn't have statin myopathy or, or the problems. So you start with a rare disease, you find a medication for that. And by the way, since we published the, the rare disease, we already know in the world we got emails we know of at least 50 people by now with the same disease, and that's within two, three months. So there are probably several hundred people that have the rare disease also, but there are thousands that have the statin myopathy. And this is a movie of 10 years ago. <laughs> גם במשפחה יש לי הרבה שחולים, ויש במשפחה שלנו מספר גדול, ו... ואני פחדתי. אני למשל, אני, היו לי ארבעה ילדים שסובלים מפיגור. מגיעים ילדים עם מחלות מאוד קשות, אם זה קשור למחלות נוירולוגיות, כאילו שיתוק ילדים, עם מחלות עיניים, מולדות. הגענו למסקנה אחת, עד מתי? עד מתי אפשר? אי אפשר לעשות חווה מילדים מסדרים. המעבדה הוקמה בשנת 2002, כשהמטרה בעצם הייתה למצוא את הבסיס המולקולרי למחלות, בייחוד באוכלוסייה הבדואית בנגב. זו אוכלוסייה עם הרבה ניסוי קרובים, הרבה מחלות גנטיות, ובכל שבט יש מחלה אחרת. והיות והמחלות האלה יחסית נדירות, לא היה את הידע עד אז 
ממה הן נגרמות, מה הגן הפגום, מה מנגנון המחלה. האוכלוסייה הבדואית היא ייחודית בזה שהנישואים בתוך המשפחה שגורמים לזה שאם אני נשא של גן, הסיכוי שגם בת הזוג שלי תהיה נשאית של מוטציה באותו גן, הסיכוי הזה קופץ. באוכלוסייה רגילה קשה מאוד למצוא את הגן, בעוד שבאוכלוסייה שהיא יותר מרוכזת עם נישואי קרובים, יותר קל להגיע לגן. דווקא היום אנשים מודעים לזה שהם רוצים להיות בריאים. והם רוצים שיהיה להם ילדים בריאים. והמסורת היא חזקה, אכן, היא מאוד חזקה, המסורת, אתה לא יכול אפילו להבין אותה מחוץ למגזר, אבל, אבל אנשים גם כן רוצים להיות בריאים. ו- ומחתנים היום התחילו לחתן מחוץ למשפחות, התחילו להיבדק לפני הנישואים, התחילו לעשות הפלות, אם יש מחלות, התחילו לעזר, התחילו לעזר גם כן בייעוץ ב- 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 ובבדיקות גנטיות. אנשים, כן, אנשים מבינים שזה, שזה לא דבר נעים לחיות עם ילד חולה. כמובן נותנים את הבדיקות ללא עלות, שזה אוכלוסייה עם מצב סוציו-אקונומי די נמוך. אני לא חושב שקיווינו לכל כך הרבה. כלומר, היה פנטזיה, חלום, שנמצא את המנגנון של איזושהי מחלה בבני אדם. וכשמצאנו את הראשונה, הייתה שמחה גדולה. היד הביתה היה אוקיי, חמש מחלות, חמש, עשר. אנחנו כבר בחמש עשרה מחלות, והקצב כיום הוא כזה שאני מניח שבדי בקרוב נגיע כבר ל-20-30 מחלות אה, מפוענחות בני אדם, שזה אה, דבר מדהים לכשעצמו. אנחנו עושים הצלבה בין הנתונים של המשפחות האלה, כן. למשל, לא מזיגות את זה אצל חולי הידיעה שמישהי או מישהו מסיים תואר שני או תואר שלישי במעבדה ומוצא ממצאים כלשהם, ותוך חודש... הממצאים האלה הופכים לבדיקה שמבוצעת בחינם לאלפי אנשים, משנה חיים של בני אדם, מצילה חיים של משפחות ממחלות נוראיות. מחקר שמצד אחד הוא רציני מאוד, ומצד שני הוא ממש מחר בבוקר מביא תועלת אמיתית ומשנה פני חייהם של אנשים. מחקר האיץ את התהליך. החלטנו, באמת ישבנו, במשפחה, והחלטנו חד משמעי להתחיל לגוון, להתחיל לצאת, להוציא בנות החוצה, לחתן אותן לאנשים ממשפחות אחרות, ולהביא בחורות ממשפחות אחרות חיצוניות. לפי דעתי, צריכים לשנות את כל המסורת של הבדואים, שזה מתחתן הבת של המשפחה, והמשפחה מתחתנת רק מהמשפחה. כדאי ויגיע הזמן, אנחנו ב-2010 עכשיו. כדאי לחשוב יותר קדימה, להסתכל אחורה מה יש לנו, ולהסתכל קדימה מה אפשר לעשות ליותר טוב. Twenty, thirty diseases were with nearly fifty diseases sorted out. Cousin marriages went down from sixty to forty percent, and things are oh no, that's not good. I need to move okay, so just one summary thing. What have we done? More than fifty human diseases, new ones discovered, prevention, effective infant mortality down, wider impact for the entire air world for the Sephardi Jewish world. In fact, this weekend I was with the Iranian community here and I found it because I discovered a disease common in the Iranian Jews. And um, a lot of lessons for biology and uh, learning about common diseases. Wonderful team, both in the medical institute, bright, tremendously bright students in the research lab, tremendously dedicated nurses in the community. Thank you. Thank you. This is really inspiring. <clears throat> so when... Uh, if you think about what Dr. 
for how his team, Dr. Burke's team has done, it's truly amazing. We talk in Metis about going from, <clears throat> from um, the lab bench to the bedside, and he's really done that in a remarkable way. So uh, I'd like to take the privilege of asking the first question. Uh, this is truly, truly remarkable. Um, so how has this been shared and influenced medicine in the rest of Israel? Well, we're uh, in a way the test case, okay? So w one of the things, for example, that happened is this 100 mutations tailored for a specific community. And once we did that, we have 30% positives. Okay, you can test for 2,000 mutations, but they're not relevant, okay? We test for the right 100. And, and then suddenly we're flooded. I mean, the, the Clinical Genetics Institute is, is falling apart because the, the research went so far away. We have so many solutions, at least tenfold more than 10 years ago, but no clinical system can grow tenfold or even twofold uh, in, in such a time. So, so you think, how do you deal with that? Can genetic counseling be done through uh, maybe movies? that are in a, an application on your phone, or be, because the, the, there's not enough genetic counselors, not enough anything. We're at the moment flooded, totally flooded in the, in the clinical setting. Um, and um, yeah, well. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, go ahead. Thank you for, thank you for this presentation, it was very helpful. How are you leveraging AI so that your data can be shared with other institutions and everyone can collaborate on your data and be able to detect mutations around the world, not only in Israel. Okay, so first of all, there are publications. So once we publish, and, and it works. You know, when, once I publish something, within a few days, I get emails from families throughout the world, from physicians throughout the world. Uh, then there are... Um, the data is online, so, so the, the g genomes of our patients that have been studied go online, so people can approach that. And uh, we try to share as much as possible. Doing good is good. AI takes off, AI takes off from there, yes. Write your letters. Hi, hi, thank you for your amazing talk over here. Um, I wanted to ask you, what stories did these tribes tell themselves why these children would be born so deformed and so sick all these years before they, you brought this modern medicine to them? Uh, I, I don't think they realized so, it, it's very funny, in closed societies, things are kept at home. You know, you don't see the affected kids in the streets. They're usually hidden somewhere. Brothers, certainly cousins, don't want to know about their cousins. We, we keep totally secretive. You, know, you, you reach a family and you say, look, if I have samples of your kids and your cousin's kids, then we can reach a solution for everyone. And they say, oh, sorry, but I don't want him to know that I... Mm -hmm. there, there are uh, cases where women, 20% of the Bedouins have a second wife. Second wife often comes from another place. And, and then she comes with maybe an X-linked disease that goes through women and affects males, okay? And you sit with them and talk and actually the husband ha knows that his wife has six brothers, but actually he thinks of, it, yeah, they've been married for 20 years and he never saw her brothers. So they actually hid that information and only when he had, you know, so, so it, it, it's very, uh, uh, they understood. They understood, I think, that it's uh, 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 genetics. But was but, there, but it's, was there it's a just, time when they, when they you know, would say it was evil spirits or that what they were being punished for something? N well, not so much, but they always 
the child fell when he was a few months old, or the child, uh, mm -hmm. you know, something, mm -hmm. or maybe in the delivery room there was mm -hmm. something, and you know, actually that may, might make them also money if uh, if they can convince anyone, which they can't. But you know, so so yes, there are various stories. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for um, being here tonight. I knew nothing about this in this part of the world, but I know about this in all over the world that's going on. And you've obviously developed a, a way of developing a model that the rest of the world can really follow. If you go to places in Africa, if you go to places in Alaska, this um, the culture is tied to a lot of what happens genetically with people, right? Because cousins marry cousins. Um, it's just a different cultural structure. How much of this has been picked up by like the World Health Organization as a model for the rest of the world? Uh, not that I know of. I know that I've been uh, approached by Arab countries from the Emirates now and from others, uh, from Uzbekistan, from you know, all sorts of countries. I'm regretfully too busy with work here in, in Israel, but but I try to, you know, so, sometimes they do setups that don't make sense, okay? If you take someone who's not in this thing, he might set up a bank of 100,000 genomes but doesn't look actually for the tribes. And you, you know, I don't need many samples. I don't need, I, I, I can actually reach a new disease gene from eight or six blood samples. I don't need a thousand, okay? And people that come from other regions in genetics that collect a thousand or 10,000 or you know, autism. Autism is a, is a huge thing, right? With, with many, it's probably a pool of, at least 100 diseases, okay? I don't look for a gene in an autism pool. I look for a family with autism, cases that actually they are similar, and through a study of 10 patients of that family, I can reach a gene which others might need 10,000 because it's, it's, they're looking into a huge pool and they need huge statistics and huge numbers and huge funds. So, so uh, it, selecting the right cases to work on and, and, and looking right at, at these inbred communities, which again, the Arab world is full of them, but it's throughout the Arab world. Jews also used to marry their first cousins in the small villages, right? E to my surprise, even in Japan, there were times that at least 10% of, of marriages were cousin marriages. So, so it's, it's uh, by the way, you, humanity or God or whatever you want to call it, uh, siblings, when they mate, 50% of the offspring die in utero. So the system does not take that, okay? Cousin marriages, extreme majority survive. They, they, they're, there are more diseases, but it's not, is it a taboo or not, you know? Take the US, various states have different decisions on that. Some, in some states, it's not allowed, cousin marriages. In some states in the US, it is allowed. So, so uh, yeah. Can I, may I? I have a question. Um, I was born in Iraq, and I'm familiar with tribal um, culture. And of course, they always need somebody that, that they really trust you know, before they change their ways. So I was thinking, if you could have a Bedouin that becomes a doctor and speaks to them, it might be a way out of that narrow channel where they're condemned to for the rest of their lives. Right, so, so uh, first of all, I agree with you. I always say that it's not an Ashkenazi Jewish Israeli that should do the change, okay? It, it should come from within. And, and that's the way we go. But again, uh, traditions are very strong and it takes time. And that's why I, I, yes, marry another tribe or whatever. But if you do marry in the tribe, not your first cousin, because that might be, 
a mutation in a single person, that your common, your shared grandfather had a single mutation, one copy did nothing to him, but his grandchildren will be sick, okay? And that no screening program will take that because it's a very specific mutation in that specific family. And if you, so, so you know, I, I, I try to play within the game. Um, people wouldn't discuss this agenda of cousin marriages some 15 years ago. Now it is being discussed openly. It's, yes, it's changing. The reasons why the habit is there is uh, the woman moves to the house of the man, and if it's a different village, a different, you know, then she moves away and they want her with, uh, the, the, there's a question of, uh, of uh, owning land in the tribe. There are, there, are, there are various tribes that think they're tremendously bright and the others are not. You know, there, there are various reasons why this happens and you need to really, I, by now I, I you know, I, I, I'm within the culture by now, okay? So a, a woman comes in, she's uh, the first wife, her husband has a second wife, and I ask her, how is that in life? You know, what? And she says, oh, well, I, I'm fine, I have eight kids, she has seven kids, and we're doing fine, and I take care of her kids, and the other way around. I'm just worried about his health, because he's trying to keep us both happy. And, you know. So, so you know, and 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 you, you or, or or a woman that comes in with uh, two very sick, mentally retarded kids, she's extremely bright, and and uh, I asked her, is there any case in the family? And she says, yes, my husband, uh, and and turns out she was widowed because of a car accident of her husband when she was 19. No one will marry her because she is no longer. Uh, you know, first hand, and she wanted to start a family and have kids, so she found a mentally retarded person of another tribe, and she knew that this way she's safe, only she stumbled on the only one with a dominant mutation, so, so she had, turns out, uh, and it was so sad because one of the kids ran out of the room, and she didn't run after him, which was... You know, um, she she was devastated. So so you know it, it's it's an interesting community with its own culture, and you can't transforming cultures is takes time, if at all. I think you should uh, also talk about uh, how many people from the community have, you know, become educated and moved into the healthcare system. Uh, and serve as a liaison back to the community. Yeah, so, so we now go back to the good side of things, okay? So the local system invested a lot in women to educate them, the Israeli system. The assumption was that a bright or, or an educated woman, first of all, will educate her kids, okay? And also will likely have less kids and more, you know, educate them and, and input into them. And you have now this generation where the women are more educated than the men in a very patriarchal society, uh, which is interesting. It, it, it works, it works, it works very interestingly and nicely. You have quite a lot now Bedouin physicians, and we invest a lot in that, and they are now there and they're making the change. And one of the people you saw is a physician. He's extremely nice and very bright. Uh, so yes, there is a change. And, and I think the 60% that went down to 40 is moving down to the probably 20, 25 within a few years. Uh, and, and, and it's a movement from inside, which is happening and, and hopefully moving forward. Yeah. Um, do you find that any of these communities are, do, do they have their own sort of traditional medicinal methods, their own kind of healers or a particular medical system that they're working from that's traditional to them that you run up against at all or that you find that you can work with in some way? So, you know, I'm from for prevention, both in diseases and, and also in this type of thing. So. 
So we just meet the religious leaders continuously, <laughs> and 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 they're with us. So 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 they just are. They they give up what we say is what they say, and and uh, into other sides of non-genetic medicine. Yes, there's herbal things that are from the Bedouins that are very interesting. Yes. Uh, before we go on, I want to be sure that we introduce two of our other board members who are here, uh, uh, Devorah Fields and Henry Bowl. So uh, Henry's been on the board for a long time, so I want to thank them for their service. I think we'll take, is that all right if we take two more questions? Are you, are you okay? You're holding up? Yeah, I'm fine. All right. Um, gentleman in the back. Thank you. Hey, so uh, super inspiration inspirational talk. Uh, appreciate you coming down here. Uh, my question is around, really around uh, like preventative measures, but from a scientific standpoint. So there's really one path of advisory that you take, which is marry far away from your genetic lineage. But what aspects are being investigated for how to uh, mitigate the effects or even pretend to prevent the mutations altogether? Well, uh, gene therapy is moving in in the past two years. I remember 30 years ago it was, oh, tomorrow morning. It wasn't, but now it is. But no one, no one does gene therapy germline. I'm changing things for the new generation. I learned my lesson in my postdoc. I generated mice with a mutation in a brain gene, and I expected a brain disease in these mice. They were born with perfect brains, but all female, all males were born male. So it turns out that this gene acts in gonad development. So, so it, it, once you intervene with germline, you're in a disaster zone, and no country in the world will allow that. Uh, so, so that's for that. Thank you so much, it was amazing. Uh, quick question, what percentage of the younger generation, and by that I mean uh, teenagers, have cell phones? Because as we know, all, all over the world, cell phones are a great source of education outside of their own community. So a very high percentage, and actually we're moving into generating things online, and, and things are being done online. And uh, yes, and th that, that's the future, and that's where we're going. Any other questions? One moment. Sorry, Mike. I'm just curious, thank you very much for the presentation. Is there a formal screening program for the Bedouin community? It seems to be very effective, cost efficient, and I, I, by presumption, could be a model for the for the entire Arab world. So, so the, what I s mentioned, the program that we run of the hundred diseases is financed by the government of Israel. By the, it's given free, and uh, yes, the, this program runs now. That's why the infant mortality rate has been going down, and uh, this is the way to go. I mean, many Arab governments do testing but they test for one disease, two diseases, and certainly I don't know very many or any communities in the world with such specific um, mapping and, and tailored testing for, for each tribe, for each, you know. Uh, and it's effective. Once you do that, it's worth uh, the effort. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to ask you if um, your hospital has an international division for international patients. For yeah, yes, uh, we have things for international patients, but we're usually too busy to deal with that. Uh, yes, it is possible, yes. I understand. And do you consider accepting international fellows, uh, fellowships, like doctors or scientists from other countries who want to come for a fellowship at your hospital? You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'll be one. <laughs> I'm sorry I was so serious and I, I, sometimes, I, usually I'm hilarious, and, but, but, 
But the, this place is so solid and so, you know, like I'm stepping on, on things that Ted Professor or someone, you know, on, so, so you sort of. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for an incredible presentation. I'm going to turn this over to Rachel. Yeah, thank you. And I meant it. You're all invited to keep in touch with us. And on your next trip to the Middle East, we'll hope you'll come and visit us at Soroka. And we can promise that he'll offer you a cup of coffee and more great conversation. Thank you. <laughs>